everybody. Welcome to Roll or Die, episode 49. You're the one before 50, Jeremy. And uh, thanks so much for spending time with us today, brother. All good. It's good to be here. Cool, man. I um, I know you from, I mean, I've seen you, like, I don't even know how old you are now. Probably, you know, early 20s, I'm guessing. But it seems like you were a kid when I met you. And there was something special about who you are. I don't know. You were like one of the up and comers under the St Kilda who was young, like really young, like a Cooper Burnham type, you know, kind of <laughs> phenom style, but you gravitated towards the ankles. And I like, I like, you really stood out in the crowd to me. So I'm really, you know, for me, it's a good one. I'm really excited to have you on the show today, man. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah so, so what what I like to do, Jeremy, I, um, I like to put on in the background, uh, usually by flow grappling or whatever, someone that we're having on their fights so i've just got some of your youtube yep. going in the background so <laughs> oh, uh, um, that's a pirate yeah. match is it yep. yes awesome. yeah it is it <laughs> is so why don't we start with that do you want to give us a little bit of a background a little bit of a breakdown on sure. that one so, so that was um so that would have been i think that was december 2019 so this was yep. uh just before a lot of that uh the, the covid sort of situation kicked off so that was that was the second match I had on um, on an international trip. I, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to the UK. Um, I, I was in the UK for about a week. I think I spent a week after that in Canada, and then I spent a week in the US. So that that was uh, the second second competi- uh, like second match in a, a multi sort of leg trip. Um, I, I'd had a match about a uh, week before that uh, on Grapple Fest against Cade Rotulo. Unfortunately, lost that one. But it was nice to have this match on Polaris a week later, um, and and you know, to, to take the win. So, so this was a match I, I dropped, uh, oh, sorry, I'd, I'd, I'd given up a couple of kilos for this one. So, so Owen, uh, I think he walks around about 83 kilos. I, I'm about 73 and we had this match at 80. Um, so, so I gave up a little bit of weight for this one, but um, I, I was pretty confident in this match. Uh, even though Owen's uh, very, very good. Uh, he, he's beaten uh, some very high level black belts like Ross Nichols um, in the past, but uh, I studying his game, I, I, felt confident that I, that I could figure him out. Um, I, I know he likes to attack uh, leg locks quite well, um, but I'm, I'm very confident in my defense and my offense. Mm. So, so I felt, you know, I, I didn't mind giving up the weight for this match. And where does that confidence come from? I mean, is that something that you've always had from childhood through to, you know, there, or did it come from just being prepared? <laughs> like what's your secret sauce? I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in preparation. So I, I, I think, uh, it, and the best example we have of this is someone like Gordon Ryan. Is that that defense is something that has to be uh, prepared for, um, in like like separate to offense. So it's not as simple as like you know, okay, like let's say we're attacking an armbar, like you know, I'm pulling down on the arm. That like like defense isn't just you know simply denying what the other person wants. It, it's having a, a specific goal. Like you know, if I'm in a submission, I'm I'm working towards a particular defensive position, rather than simply trying to deny my opponent what they want. And this means that we have a lot more versatility with our defense, and it means that we don't have to have like a specific reaction for every single type of action. Mm. It means that I'm actually working towards something rather than simply trying to survive. And so they, that means that then we can start building these really creative games around defense that allow us to go from defense uh, directly into offense. I, I think uh, actually there's, a, there's a, a video recently of John Danaher talking about exactly that talk, but, but he's talking more about, uh, about, you know, defense, like, you know, being defensive within pins and going into to offensive position. We, we can do the same with submission mm. where we can start walking that sort of fine line between, you know, uh, you know, offense and defense, and we can start looking at like sort of jumping back and forth across that line rather than like looking for it, you know, purely resetting to a, to a neutral position. We can, we can go straight into offensive positioning. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I can't say that I do that. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. Oh shit. I'm the black belt the here, benefits. but uh, yeah, not happening. <laughs> Uh, it, it's the benefits of getting to train full time that uh, you, you can you can really like sort of like take a deep dive into a lot of these things. And that was what I actually found um, going from training part time to training full time um, is that I, I was able to really sort of explore some of these positions that, that I would have normally have had the time to before. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, having having a full schedule now, like normally when you know you're, you're training part time and you, you've got a, a, another job you're working simultaneously, you, you sort of just like if you want to compete, you're working on the essentials. So you spend a lot more time working on just your your competition game, just working purely on your, the offensive side of your game, 
But I think when you have the ability to train full time, you can start expanding out and, and fleshing out other skill sets that are that are still very important, but not necessarily immediately apparent when it comes to competition. Because ideally in competition, you know, you're not going to give up like a grip you're not going to give up a position you want to be you know to avoid that you work on like that first clash and and winning those first clashes um every single time but it's nice to be able to have confidence in defense so then you know for these longer sort of more drawn out matches you can have a good back and forth clash no wonder you win so many matches bro you've got a very deep perspective (laughs) on that i think uh, you're being a a little bit humble though like uh, honestly like you um, you listed here on Flow Grappling uh, last year under the article, the toughest no-gi competitors who aren't black belts. So I think that um, <laughs> there's more to it than you just like training full-time. Like you're pretty, you're, you're pretty world-renowned sort of thing. So yeah, you're one of, well, I hope the other guests don't mind me saying you're one of the biggest names that we've had on this <laughs> podcast. So it's, it's quite an honor to have you on. So yeah. Oh. I think uh, you're being a little bit too humble there, in my opinion, but that's just me. (laughs) Thank you. Um, I I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, like we all have the same amount of time in the day. And part of it is identifying what is going to be critical towards success. Um, uh, And and really like, you know, divvying up your time and being smart in your time in the right ways. Um, And, and one of, one of, I think one of the elements that goes into this is the ability to, to learn information and not just be like, oh, you know, like, like this idea of like, whether or not someone's a, you know, a quick learner or a slow learner, but, but also the method that people take towards learning. Mm. Um, So one of the things that Lachlan, I, uh, it was a, it was a little study he ran in the gym. I think it was either in uh, 2017 or 2018. It was, it was, yeah, exactly. Like it was the result of like a, an emergent study um, on the way that people learn information. Like it was almost like the comparison between like, you know, like take, like properly studying for a test versus cramming last minute. Um, mm. And so this idea of like, okay, if, let's say, for example, we want to take an approach to learning three new skill sets in jujitsu. Um, the idea is that maybe I'd work on two of them for a week. And the idea is that maybe the next week I'd switch out one of those those skill sets. And so therefore I'm working, you know, my second and third skill set. And then maybe in the third week, I'm, you know, working my my first and third skill set. And the idea is to make sure that you you work on it for a set period of time, you take a break from it, and then you come back to it and you, you refresh that information, work out what sort of stuck with you and what hasn't. And then like, you know, keep trying to hone that skill. So you so you want to make sure that when you're learning these things, you're, you know, you, you, you come back to it regularly. So that way it really sticks. Mm, amazing. And, and so I think, yeah. So instead of going from one thing to the next constantly, where you're not really going to absorb that information. So I think that's a wise, like a wise way to sort of like divvy up your time instead of spending say six months on one thing, um, work it in like, you know, say like one month block. So, you know, instead of spending, you know, half of like the year working on one skill set, it's like every second month spend, spend on that skill set. Cool. Awesome. I think that's, oh, that's yeah. great. Amazing. That's great. All right. Well, let's shift direction a little bit here. So I want you to picture sure. you're, you're, there's a zombie apocalypse, right? There's a helicopter. <laughs> it's going to get you out of here and it's going to have some mats on that, right? There's going to be some mats. It can only hold one type of food, one type of drink. And you can choose between Lockie or Craig Jones to take away with you and live on this desert island, probably for the rest of your life. Who are you going to choose and what kind of food and drink are you going to take with you, brother? The problem is, is that I don't think I want to live with either of them for the rest of my life. Like, can I, can I just, leave, can I take myself and just enjoy my own sweet company? <laughs> Who are you going to roll with, man? Who are you going to roll with? Oh, it, it, but at what cost? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's break it down to this. What kind of food are you going to say? What kind of food? Yeah, um, so that's, oh, a, that's yeah. something I wanted to discuss. So you're a vegetarian, Jeremy. Talk, talk us through yeah. uh, being a vegetarian athlete and uh, sure. what that means. Sure. So, so, um, it's, so I chose to be a vegetarian for, for ethical reasons. One of the things I'm doing now, though, is because is, I've been a vegetarian for, for over two years. Um, just because of uh, like some injuries I've been picking up in training over the last uh, six to 12 months, what I'm doing at the moment is as I'm sort of shifting back and forth, um, I'm, I'm having meat again, but um, in limited amounts, just to sort of see how my body reacts to that and see, see how I feel, whether or not to, 
to, you know, sort of explore uh, if my diet is affecting the, like, you know, is it going to have an impact on my injuries and things like that? If like that might be, you know, if there's some sort of correlation there at all. Um, just because I know uh, reading about different studies uh, related to, you know, uh, certain things that you, you can get in, like fish oil and things like that. While, while fish oil isn't vegetarian, you know, like that's probably one of the hardest things to make up for in a vegetarian diet is, uh, yeah. is sort of like the, the you know, the, I, I, my understanding, I can't remember exactly what the, uh, what the actual vitamins are, but I, my understanding is that you, the human body is really, really inefficient in, uh, you know, converting foods uh, to those particular vitamins. And so I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm just sort of playing around with uh, what my diet is exactly right now. But at the moment, my my conclusion is that it's not having uh, much of an impact on, on me personally in terms of how it's affecting my injury. So I, I'll be going back to um, a hard vegetarian diet very soon. Right. Um, but it, I, I think it's always worth exploring these things because there's, you've got to find a balance to everything in life, I believe. Yeah, and what about with the injuries? Where do you like? Are they all around the ankle lip region and <laughs> leg region? No, no. So, <laughs> the so other I, persons. So uh, I, I, the, if I. <laughs> I hope no one I ever compete against hears this. <laughs> um, but so, so, it's unlikely, uh, so, Jeremy. We have a very small yeah. listener base. Sorry, sorry. They're, they're, both masters in, 50 years old, they're not going to be in your division. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so upper and lower body injury, um, though none of them are from leg locks uh, specifically, a lot more to do with, uh, you know, like, like, like a lot of open guard play and things like that. Um, and a lot of them, they're, they're, they're more, Oh no, his we're connections just, dropped out. Ah, his just as we were getting that. His competitors, he, he did it on purpose. So it's right. What's going like, on? I hope you can still hear us. We can't hear you, Jeremy. <laughs> See, these upper, the, these other podcasts, Anton, these professional deals don't have these sort of technical right. well, difficulties. We have to today. The same room. We need to do some tap dancing or something for the year. Uh... I don't know, man. <laughs> Hopefully he can just log out and log back in or something. Yeah. We had well, this happen with Cam Rowe, I think, as well. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So it happens for the great ones. The good It podcast, does. That's exactly right. Yes. Hey, and I'm sure keep it in, in, keep it in. <laughs> yeah, in his early days, I'm sure Joe Rogan also experienced many of these things. And look where he is now. Exactly. So let's um, there's still there's still hope. I'm sure there is. So, yeah. No <laughs> drama. Go, maybe edit all. out from now on. <laughs> on. Or we could keep it in and we could drop a little um, up, a little update to tell people that the next episode we're going to do, the 50th episode, is going to be a good one. Mm. So if they are listening this far in, so make sure they tune in and listen to the f- next episode that we're going to yeah. unleash, which will be the 50th one. We've done, done 50 episodes. I think that's a lot, man. That's a lot. I think that's way more than other jiu-jitsu right. podcasts so in Australia. Anyway. Right, we're just grinders, Kim. We just can't help yeah, man. Just... That's, it. that's it, man. <laughs> but that's the way. Honestly, that's the way I got my black belt. So, that's yeah, right. just keep grinding. Just that's keep right. showing up. And, and sometimes you're the hammer and sometimes you're the nail. Yeah. So. Yes, so hopefully Jeremy is able to get a connection on and we can... Actually, just before we do, hopefully he doesn't Mm -hmm. come back yet because I want to drop a big um, thank you to Theo, your partner, because he's been editing these for the last, I don't know, 20 or so episodes, doing an amazing job and he thinks about things, he comes up with the titles and the credits, he's really involved, he's now taking up jiu-jitsu, I see him at the club, he has six geese. Which is amazing. Don't tell the world that, man. He's so embarrassed that I've told you. And he's like, everyone knows now. Ah, man, Jeremy's back. back. Hey, sorry. Sorry. Hey. Because of where my phone was sitting, it was directly in the sun and it overheated. Sorry about that. Played guitar. It was all good, man. It was all we good. all have these. Te- <laughs> we've had technical issues before. All good. All good. But you were just about so- to drop a big... Yeah. Knowledge on oh us. yeah. So, so so they're mainly they're mainly from uh more to do with like like re- repeat strain in in particular joints. Mm. So it's it's been a bit of a bit of a battle over the last twelve months uh with that um, and so that's why I sort of resorted to just like shifting my diet, um just just because like I I, I found like okay they they were more re- like repeat strain injuries, but they were never healing. So that's why I thought, okay, maybe it's diet related because I know there's some studies showing that like um, more so with vegans, but like long-term vegan diets are like, you know, have like a high propensity for, for injury. So that's why I thought I'd sort of have a play around with my diet. But um, 
so far, like, cause I've been, I've been trying that for, for a couple of weeks now and I haven't really found much of a shift. So, so that's why I'm, you know, like almost like the diet sort of coincides uh, with the injuries there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. And um, so what's going on? So just to, we should have probably started with this, but you're in Sydney now. Um, yep, you, sure. You're going to come back to Melbourne or what? What's up? Um, so, so that's the plan long-term. So this was um, a bit of a funny one. Like, so this was, you know, the first lockdown with COVID happened. I think that was nearly three months long. My parents live up in Newcastle, just like, so that's uh, just north of Sydney. And I thought uh, I, I'd head up and just like, uh, uh, you know, go see family and stuff. And and then just while I was up here, um, I think a couple of days before I was heading back to Melbourne, actually, um, there'd been some cases popping up in Melbourne. And so I thought, oh, well, that's not a good sign because they were talking about shutting the border. And then, you know, pretty much uh, I, I saw that and I thought they're probably going to go into lockdown. And that's exactly what happened. So it was more a matter of like the, just, you know, I happened to be in, in Sydney essentially when the Melbourne lockdown happened. And, you know, that went for six months. So So the longer I was here, I was paying double rent at the time. So I needed to move out of my place. Like it was just making it tough Um, because I, because I, I I could have stayed at my parents, but then I wasn't able to really make any money um, in, in Newcastle uh, through jujitsu. So I was staying in Sydney. So that way I could still pay rent back in, uh, back in Melbourne. And yeah. So, so it's just ended up being Melbourne. So you might. No, I don't anymore. So, uh, so, so I, so I have moved out, but the, the, uh, Sydney's not necessarily the the long term plan. Like I, for the time being, what I what I'm looking to do when when sort of things steady a little bit more with COVID is potentially travel back and forth. Yeah. Um. For you know to be able to train regularly with like Lachlan and the rest of the team. Um. That that that's what I'm hoping to do. Let, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. Well, actually, that's an interesting yeah. one. So Lockie and Craig, two very different styles, and and you're underneath both of them. Like you've got two dads, which is great. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Lockie is all about coaching and competing. And Craig really. Oh, sorry. Do you have to get to your next class? Do you have to get to your yeah. Next sorry. Class? Sorry. One of the guys was heading off, and I was just uh, just yeah. saying goodbye. Sorry. No, 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 sorry. No, I was no, listening. No, 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 it's fine. So yeah. Like, so Lockie's style is teach and compete, whereas Craig's style yep. is teach as little as possible and compete. You know, <laughs> and like that's my observation anyway. And it's like they're both very yep. valid styles, but. Um, yep. I guess my question is, yeah, what are your thoughts about that for yourself? Because you're doing a lot of teaching right now, but you're doing it to pay the bills. Would you rather not be teaching? I I actually prefer teaching over competing. Um, competing's more just something. It's I, I think competition is a is a good direction to devote my my efforts in training. So like it, it's it's one of those things where you know like human en- ingenuity is really impressive. Where the less you give a person, the more they the more they can they they do with it. Yeah. Like, like, so, you know, like, for example, like if I was going to, you know, hands, like give someone a handful of clay and, you know, I, I gave you six months to make, you know, the, or, you know, a month, let's say to make like a really impressive piece of art, like, like it'd be, you know, really quite intricate, really quite small and detailed. If I gave someone, you know, a mountain of clay, it's just such an overwhelming, like an overwhelming number of possibilities that like they take that one month just to even work out what they could even possibly do with that clay. Mm. Like they, they like it. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, if you can really sort of hone in on what you want to work on, um, you can really get quite creative with it. Mm. Um, it it's why, for example, like it, even by comparison, like, you know, you, you see, say, for example, in wrestling, just like the intricacies in grip fighting. Mm-hmm. And while those in- intricacies can exist in jiu-jitsu, I think we see it potentially evolving at a slower pace only because there's so much in jiu-jitsu to work on. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, even then something that can make, you know, again, we were talking about like, like efficacy and uh, time management with jiu-jitsu. We can uh, sort of, you know, sharpen that, you know, become a little bit more efficient even further by just really sort of targeting what are essential skill sets for a competitive game. Because like there, there are people that you can roll with in the gym that don't compete and they have these absolutely mind-blowing strategies where they've almost created their own little jiu-jitsu rule set for themselves. Like uh, one of my teammates, uh, Jamie Selby, he has a really interesting half guard game where the idea is that he doesn't care if he's on top or bottom. His whole goal is to climb from your ankles all the way up to your shoulders to submit you. Mm. And so, so, you know, because he doesn't really focus on competing, he's almost created this own little game for himself and his own little... Um, 
you know, mini strategy where, where it's just simply a matter of getting, you know, from the ankles to the shoulders. So he, so he, he's almost doing the same technique, whether he's on top or bottom. And so there's this idea of he doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether he gets swept or not. He doesn't even care if he's necessarily passing the guard. He's just trying to get to this really specific position. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, like you can get really creative with on a honing on like a really almost like, you know, specific game like that. And I, and I think devoting your efforts in competition uh, to competition, uh, you know, make that a, a bit more efficient. That's so insightful. Sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded yeah. answer. No, 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 we like long-winded. Super, super fucking cool. insightful, man. I'm so grateful <laughs> you shared that. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah no, that's good. <laughs> that's cool. Um, and can you talk a little bit about, we ask pretty much everyone when they come on to just talk about their sure. beginnings in Jiu-Jitsu and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it sounds like you've moved around a bit. You, yeah. You're in Sydney now. You, you previously were in Melbourne. And, um, yeah, so tell us where you started, how you got sure. into so- Jiu-Jitsu. Sure. So um, I started jiu-jitsu when I was 16. I, I was fortunate enough to get, get exposed to it at an early age. Um, this was uh, just when my family had, had moved to Newcastle. So before that, we'd lived in, uh, lived in Canberra. We'd lived on the, the central coast. We, we'd moved around a bit just for a variety of reasons related to, to my parents' work and like family and where they were sort of at. Um, so my mum had got me into karate when we'd lived on the central coast when I, when I was younger. Um, and so when we moved to Newcastle, she, she wanted to make sure I was, you know, uh, still doing something like that. Um, and at this karate gym, they, they had a little bit of jiu-jitsu going on uh, once or twice a week, just sort of on the side there. And I, I saw that and I thought that, you know, just, I, just, I just saw it and thought, that looks really cool. So I, I'll, I'll go give that a go. And I fell in love with it immediately. Um, and so the, the place I was training at at the time, it was a, a little, like, oh, sorry, the, the karate dojo itself is actually quite big. Um, but, but the jiu-jitsu there is a, a smaller sort of crew. Um, and that was at a gym. Yeah. yeah so, so they just had like a small mat space and they, they were only running a couple of times a week. Um, but it was a gym called Hunter Valley Martial Arts. Now, uh, they, they did have a black belt that was teaching there, but he was only able to make it probably once every two weeks or so. Um, so, and, and then at the time when I was thinking about moving gyms originally, I, I was uh, looking at going to university and things like that. So for a couple of different reasons, um, you know, just wanting to, to get a bit more direction with my training from a black belt, as well as, um, just, to you know, lined up a little bit better with my schedule with university. Um, I, I moved over to Best and Gracie. Um, and so I spent, uh, probably most of my time training at, at Beston's. Um, so training there under Luke Beston and, uh, and Keon Harris, who had a massive impact, uh, on my jiu-jitsu overall and they they still do like i still get to train with them regularly which is really good um so so those that was probably more my formative years in jiu-jitsu uh training uh at best and gracie i'd say wow. and and yeah so so though it was it's there was no like story of like getting bullied as a kid nothing like that it was just i, I saw jiu-jitsu and i thought <laughs> that looks really cool i'm gonna go give that a go so more just like how anyone starts a hobby i'd say yeah, but did, yeah. you didn't. But you didn't watch the UFC, for example, like most of us did, and then go, "I want to try that." No, way. man, he's young. He's <laughs> exactly. so much. Younger. The UFC's been around for forever. We talked to the OGs who were like our age. That's why they started. <laughs> the UFC two hundred, and he saw yeah. it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, like I, I, I didn't, I didn't have like you know the the stories of like Chuck Norris and. Uh, yeah like uh all those different guys going up so so the mma was like like a thing when i was growing up i i'd, I'd seen it i wasn't like a uh, like an avid fan of mma um it was just more something that i'd seen like clips of on the internet and things like that and i'm like oh that looks cool but i never really like went and watched it mm. um so so i i was you know i'd gotten into jiu-jitsu I, i'd say i i started doing jiu-jitsu thinking like oh this would be cool to do this and then get into mma yeah. Um, but like very quickly it became, you know, uh, I just want to do jujitsu and I'm going to do jujitsu for the sake of jujitsu. And what's awesome. next like for you? Because I mean, obviously you're very young still. How old are you? Uh, 25. 25. That's very young. Like your brain is now finally fully formed and you can <laughs> you know, like this year. So you're now a, a general, you're a man, right? And like, have you got, like, you've done a lot of amazing things already, which can have all sorts of impacts. But, like, what is your, like, where do you see jujitsu and yourself in, like, five years from now? Do you want, you're in gym? Is that, like, or? Sure. Um, so, I, I, I go back and forth on the idea of whether or not I'd ever have my own gym. Um, I just think, like, just, just the landscape at the moment, there's a lot of gyms opening up everywhere. And I, I think by the time I'd be opening a gym, it, it's very possible that it would be, 
uh, a very tough sort of like financial situation to be in potentially. Yeah. Um, so, so like there's the possibility that it's like, I go to somewhere where there's just no jujitsu and I open a gym um, and just, you know, like whether it's like in just some foreign country or something or like a somewhere a bit more rural. Um, but my focus long-term is teaching. I mean, even my focus short-term is teaching. It's just, you know, um, speckled with competitions here and there. Um, just to both sell the teaching and also to test out what I'm teaching. Nice. Um, like I, essentially my, my philosophy is, is that I don't teach anything that I don't do. So I don't teach someone else's curriculum. Um, I don't teach someone else's technique unless I actually use it um, in training consistently. Yeah. I think it's a way to keep it a bit more honest. And so I think also as well as is competition helps keep me honest and it. Uh, you know it, it it stops like forming these almost like cult like personalities that uh that arise in jiu-jitsu where you know they don't train they're they're just dictating what to do and they're, they're never ever um you know looking to to test themselves and and that's something that i really admire about lachlan and craig uh like guys like sean Ligurik, uh lachlan conway uh you know michael you high like all these different high level coaches that always like that are still competing Mm. um consistently or, or even like you know uh tiago stefanuti for example like he's been doing jiu-jitsu very very long long time and like he's still competing yeah which i you know it, like i think he's like you know like guys like him they're, they're in a situation where they could easily just not compete mm -hmm. but they still push themselves constantly and they're, they're willing to always throw down and I, I i really admire that that's amazing wow thank you for sharing that awesome. all good Kim, have you got, you awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we've sort of covered everything, but I still feel like there's so much more <laughs> that we could say. I don't even know. Um, have you got another question up your sleeve, Anton, that you're <laughs> yeah, you looking at? I, I do. Um, uh, mm, no, actually, I've, I really, like, you are so articulate and you have yeah. such, like, I, actually, one of the things I'd like to know is, like, as a 25-year-old, if I came on even this show, I would have been so nervous. It would have been ridiculous. I would have, you know, I would have really struggled. There's no way my vision would have been as clear as yours. Where the fuck does that come from? And did you create it? Did you get it through jujitsu? Did you get it through karate? Did you get it earlier than that? Because like, I literally, like, I remember my twenties to thirties. I, I was, I was terrified of people, you know, and I don't know why you're not terrified of people. I want to know that. <laughs> um i i think uh you know the teaching sort of like breaks that you know it breaks the ice on that pretty easily I, i've also had um some some really uh really quite good coaches uh through my jiu-jitsu career like uh yeah like like as i mentioned luke best and i also should mention uh grant bradshaw like he's he's had a massive influence um on my my ability as a teacher um grant uh, has his own academy on the central coast as well as also he's a, a high school teacher um and he's someone that's always kept me very humble and honest and has always been a major influence on me and then as well as having guys like uh lachlan and craig um and then craig's also someone that you know you have to be uh careful what you say like like he, he was spring spring on you for any little thing like like any sort of like misspeaking um so okay. so that, that helps you stay articulate yeah like <laughs> yeah i got it so 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 a couple of different influences good and bad in that regard but no like but also craig is also uh, you know a, a great influence there like if you look at uh when, whether he's teaching or whether he's being interviewed on flow grappling anything like that he's very articulate um and very clear in what he's saying um, mm. yeah right yeah. Awesome. Hey, I've got one more. Yeah. So with um, your experience, you've talked about a lot of different clubs. You, you have sort of no issue with traveling around. I know it's probably not really as a uh, bigger thing anymore, but some old school jujitsu practitioners really like to follow the whole, you don't switch schools. You, you, no, none of that. So you, where you start is where you finish. Um, what do you say to that? Like, what do you think? Obviously, the world's changed. You know, internet makes jujitsu readily available. So, yeah, maybe it's a little bit old way of thinking. But what do you think yeah. about that in terms of loyalty and stuff? Um, I think, I think you know, the, the, the way I feel about it is is that that idea of loyalty. I, I think this might maybe a bit more controversial, but I think like the people that preach that idea of loyalty, the hardest and that idea of like, you know, you can't train anywhere else. It, like that's almost one way loyalty. Um, because, you know, like if we like, you know, 
particularly like, like I think it's a different story if you're talking about, you know, someone gets a train for free. Um, but in terms of the idea of a paying customer, like I shouldn't, like, I don't think I should be expected to be loyal when, you know, I like, if I'm giving them my money, I, I think that's, uh, you know, the people that sort of like they're, they're taking your money, but then they're also telling you that you have to be loyal to me. Like, like that, I, I think that's, a, that's being disloyal towards the, the customer essentially. I, and I think also, I think outside of that, it is not good for jujitsu to be dividing ourselves in this way, especially in Australia. Like you look at the way things are going in Adelaide, for example, with jujitsu, we have some amazing competitors coming out of Adelaide and it's from the fact that they've decided to get together and all train together. And I think that's really the secret. Like you look at the, the way Lachlan um, set things up, like, like at least with his gym in Melbourne is this idea of he doesn't care, um, you know, what gym you're from, who you represent. He just wants to make sure he's getting the best guys in the room um, to come train with him. So that way he can get better and it's going to make the whole room better. Like for example, like, you know, Lachlan accepted, you know, uh, say Ari to back and hope Douglas with open arms and they represent Cicero Costa every time they compete. And that's not a problem. And I don't think anyone looks at them like in the room and says, Oh, you know, these guys are Creanche or anything like that. It's, it's no, these guys are valuable assets to our, like, you know, to our training and we should be able to, you know, let people also go out and, you know, like get good training in other places. I, I think that's the way to build a really strong team. It's the same with um, like, you know, here in Sydney, I, I think, uh, that that's changing as well. Like for example, like uh, Keller Lock, uh, Keller Lock Sodi, who runs Grappling Education, he's he's the same way. He's just he wants the best guys to come train because he wants a really strong training environment, and he doesn't care where those people go and train outside of the gym. That's up to them what they do in their their own lives as well. Yeah, yeah. no, that makes sense. That's awesome. No one's ever yeah. said. No one's ever compared it to you know a paying customer on our show before because we ask quite a lot of people this, and I really I get that. Like I think. It is a valid thing. If you're if you're giving someone your time for nothing, then it is it is a valid request to ask them for their loyalty or at least to be in communication about it. And but if they're a yeah. paying customer, I, I I'm, I'm on board with your philosophy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, like I, I I think it's one of those things where it's you know if I'm paying if I'm paying someone money and they're saying yeah but you owe me. That means like, you, you know, that I think that's a dishonest transaction. It's either, you know, charge me more because clearly you don't think I'm paying you enough or, you know, you know, just like, just be completely, completely open and transparent about it. I, I, I you know, that's not written in the contract anywhere is it, that you can't train and train somewhere else. So, so I don't know why that expectation is there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jeremy, that, that makes Jeremy sense. Skinner. I just want to thank you. You know, the bottom line is that you are already, I already held you in high regard before today and you've gone up so many more notches, bro. <laughs> like really, holy shit. You are a powerhouse. And uh, yeah, just really, I'm sure I speak for Kim as well. When I just yeah, absolutely. Right away. Yeah, yeah, so thank you so much for giving up your time. You're a busy man. We've uh, had to negotiate to get you get you here. So it's great you could <laughs> even take some time out to come into the car for it. So yeah, it thank good. you again. And um, yeah, we'll aim to have this out ASAP. So share it if you can. You've got a big All following. Good. So that'll help list our, lift our listener base from the two people that are listening four. currently to double. maybe even four. Yeah, we yeah. won't I'll get up there. So. No, we're on Spotify and iTunes and all that sort of stuff as well. So yes. So, yeah. If you listen, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Definitely. Next. Awesome. I'll make sure to definitely share it. Thank you for awesome. having me on, guys. Yeah, thank it was you. Good to chat. And uh, hopefully we can, if this COVID situation settles down, we can have you back in Melbourne for a little bit because, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're definitely an asset that we like to use down here. That's right. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Bye.